Welcome to the school committee meet regular meeting of Thursday, February 13th, 2020. Uh, we're going to open tonight's meeting with some new artwork. So tonight the artwork is from the Stratton School. And the teacher at the Stratton School is Melody Wolf Thomas. The Stratton School art program follows the Teaching for Artistic Behavior, TAB model. TAB is a philosophy that regards the students as artists in the classroom as their studio. A, t a TAB program is learner-directed, learner emergent, and honors student choice. Uh, so I'm not going to be talking about each of the bulletin boards, so uh, if you want to go ahead and pan uh, on ACMI uh, starting each of the bulletin boards, uh, that would be great. Um, Student learns, students learn about art media, art media techniques in the art world. Projects are student led and teacher supported. The studio is arranged in centers and students have the choice of what centers they would like to work in each day. Exploring their own ideas and purposes, determining the purpose of their art as well as reflecting on their work are fundamental components of a TAB program. In this show, grades K through five are represented. Each piece is accompanied by an artist statement that gives further insight into the artwork. We hope you enjoy the, the unique, the varied and unique voices of our young artists at Stratton. To learn more about teaching artistic behavior, you can <coughs> visit the website, which is one long word, teachingforartisticbehavior.org. All right. And, uh, We'll give uh, one more minute to complete the cycle of the various bulletin boards. Thank you to all the Stratton artists for sharing your artwork with us. All right, next we'll move on to public comment. Um, uh, each participant will have up to three minutes to speak. And um, uh, pursuant to open meeting laws, uh, the school committee generally will not address the topics discussed, but um, uh, they may be discussed at a, at a future meeting or referred to a subcommittee. So the first person on the list is Courtney Rodlin. Please come up to the table and uh, state your name again and uh, speak into the microphone. Thank you. ski team. Um, for the past few years, Arlington has had a ski team that's been operating as a club, and um, they've had uh, about 20 kids on the team this year. Um, though they're a new team and, and a smaller team than the other schools that we've been participating against, um, they've had a great showing. Um, we had two students this year who placed in the top 10 and would have been able to compete at the state level, but um, right now, since we're a club sport and we're not a um, recognized school-sponsored varsity sport, um, unfortunately, they've had to um, concede and give their spots to children from other schools. Um, so skiing is, a, is an MIAA sport, and um, I believe that having this uh, funded and supported by the schools will offer more opportunities for um, children with varied interests, interests excuse me, to participate in sports where they can engage and socialize with their peers. Um, and uh, also it would provide opportunities for students of all genders. Um, I have really enjoyed being a part of the team this year. It's a very dedicated group of uh, parents and children, very dedicated. And uh, uh, my impression is from the community that there are many other parents and children who will be looking to get their children involved in this sport. Um, of course, there are budget considerations, um, though it seems like they've, the coach and organizers have done their homework um, in talking to the other schools about um, their budgets. Um, and compared to other high school sports, it seems like a relatively low budget item, though we are asking to be considered um, in the budget to be a school-sponsored sport in the future. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, and next we have Kate Leary. Hi, um, I'm Kate Leary. I have 
children at the Hardy School and the Gibbs School. Um, <coughs> do I need to say anything else? Like, no, no. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm here because I just happened to see on your Arlington that, that the budget was being discussed tonight, and I know you've been working on this all winter long, um, and that there are a lot of considerations. Um, so I was able to grab it like an hour ago and look at it. So I have some sort of preliminary que questions with the understanding that I know you don't respond to them directly, but you are discussing the budget tonight. Um, so it was really great to see so many things from the five-year strategic plan being starting to be realized in this budget. Um, I did have a question. Um, one of the big things in the override and in the budget, um, you know, maybe not big monetarily, but I think kind of important, um, was librarians and library books that the school department is paying for library books in the elementary schools again, which I think <coughs> is important in terms of just showing the school department's values as well as on a very practical level. Um, and I didn't see it called out anywhere on the budget for this year, and I'm curious about that. Um, it might be that it's a technicality because of, of where the money comes from. Um, but I did notice that dedicated art supplies are in the budget, which I think is great. Um, I noticed that you said that the principals are paying for them out of their, mm -hmm. their budgets. But um, I can also attest that PTOs have been heavily funding art supplies. Hardy has had $1,000 worth of art supplies in our budget for years. Um, so I think this is great. Um, I'm curious if the library books could be called out in the same way, and if there's a technical reason that they can't be. Um, is it possible to at least name them in the narrative, um, you know, maybe under whatever sort of heading they would fall under? Because I think that I know that budgeting is done on an annual level, but I think it's important for us to see that the school department is continuing to support that. Um, another note about library books is that although the money, $5,000 a year, is in the elementary school budgets, I know that there have been some logistical problems with actually getting the library books, with actually being able to order them and get them into our schools. I'm not totally sure where that stands now or if it's been worked out, but I hope that that's being prioritized, sorting out how to do POs and make sure that books can get into libraries in a timely fashion because I know PTOs are still being asked to fund simply because they can write a check faster than the school department. I don't expect that the school department can do it with the same speed, but I expect that they could do it within a couple of months and I'm not sure that that's happening right now. I'd love to be corrected on that. Um, if I'm wrong. Um, so that was what I wanted to say. Thank you for your work on the budget. Thank, Thank you. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Is there anybody else for public participation? All right. So the next item on our agenda is the trip, the approval of the Arlington High School France and England trip. And Lisa Clark will be presenting that. Thank you. Hello, I'm Lisa Clark. I'm a history teacher at the high school. Thank you for letting me come and speak to you this evening. Um, I've never done this before, so do I go? Do you go? How does this work here? Would you like a little summary? Uh, yeah, so generally, gen generally we just get a very brief summary of the, you know, the reason behind the trip. Um, uh, and then uh, we have the materials and we can ask questions if there's anything else. Okay, great. So I was fortunate enough to chaperone the EF-led tour of Holocaust history last year, and it was just an amazing experience for me and for the students, and it gave me an opportunity to interact with students in a different way and to really kind of globalize the history that we teach sometimes with an American, you know, primary perspective. And when I was looking at the other tours that EF offered, I saw this tour of the Western Front of World War II, visiting numerous sites in England as well as France. And I was very intrigued by the opportunity and the possibility to globalize American history. And particularly in regard to historical memory, this is something that all of the history classes I've been talking about, particularly in response to the controversies <coughs> in recent years in the United States with removal of statues of Confederates and not even Confederate soldiers, um, but Stephen Foster, for instance, had his statue removed, the statue of him in Pittsburgh removed. And so just this discussion of historical memory and this trip 
offers our students the opportunity to see how the American participation in World War II is remembered in various countries throughout the world. And also students would get the opportunity to visit sites like the D-Day invasion and cemeteries. They would also get a chance to take a ferry across the English Channel and kind of experience perhaps some of the route that some of the soldiers took on their way to fight during World War II. And so when I saw this tour, I was very excited about the possibility of taking students on a trip to, again, add to their understanding of this global event and to build on this discussion of historical memory. Thank you. Questions? Ms. Seuss. No, I just have a comment. Or comment? Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, same um, comment I had last time we talked about trips, which is in the pre-trip prep. Mm -hmm. There's a sentence there that I find objectionable, which is that um, that the history teachers will be asked to mention their, to their classes of sophomores, juniors, and seniors. The, the, the sort of inner requirement that the teachers mention within a class time about the trip, and cause, because these are not sponsored by the school, mm -hmm. we do provide a resource, like a room to meet. There is sometimes a message sent out, but I just think it's inappropriate to have it um, require teachers to mention it in their classrooms. Okay. I if I wrote teachers are required to mention it, that wasn't um, my my goal. I think it's their standard thing, so I think it was taken out in the, the other mm -hmm. thing we're going to approve. I'd love to see it taken out here as well. That's fine with me. I would just ask my colleagues in the history department if we could possibly place posters you know, in the history hallways or throughout the school. It won't be a requirement that history teachers are you know, asked to use class time to promote this trip in any way. but. You know, perhaps during in passing, if there are signs up and students have questions, if teachers could direct them my way. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. Hainer, I think the trip is an exciting trip. Uh, I envy, what is available for those students that don't go to to sort of balance the knowledge that and the experience that these students are going to have? Mm -hmm. Is there something that for the students that are not able to go for whatever reason uh, that they can experience too. They're not going to be able to go, but I didn't know if there's any videos or anything like that. Have you considered that? I have. I mean, I am actually currently enrolled in a class with primary source about globalizing American history. So from my professional standpoint, I would love to gather resources and video and photographs that I could use in my classroom as well. And I could share with the other members of the history department, again, to add to that kind of globalization of World War II. Um, I haven't research what videos are currently available on these particular sites to add into my classroom, but using kind of virtual field trips is something that I have implemented in my classes over past years using museum websites and things like that. So it is my hope as well from my pro professional standpoint that I'll be able to get experience and resources that I can build into my I lessons. Just, I just think it's important because there <laughs> are students that are not going to be able to afford this, and uh, I'm really concerned for a public entity and uh, I think going is great, but it would be great if everyone could go. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I agree. Mr. Shukman. In the application that we have before us, we have day three in London, mm -hmm. and then the following page is day seven in Normandy. I think we're missing days four, five, and six. Huh. I have an updated itinerary that I can provide you with copies of. I had mm -hmm. double checked, and I was under the impression that every day was accounted for, but I have a detailed itinerary that I can provide you with right now if. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. That would be great. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, just to speak to Mr. Schlickman's point, I think what he's saying is that the itinerary as printed in the form, it, I think there's some technical difficulties with the Google form. We're missing some of the pages. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I noticed that we're missing a question, which is, what is the process for students who may have difficulty paying for the trip? And additionally, we're missing pay whatever page has days four through seven. The itinerary was appended at the end um, from uh, uh, whatever the company is. Um, but I guess my question is, I don't 
have a problem approving this. I'm assuming the information is actually out there. We just didn't get it in our PDF, but I would ask that the administration go through and see the missing, see the pages that we're missing right now. Karen is. Yeah, it, is, it may have two sided to one side. For sure. So just, yeah, just the itinerary. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, because I, I printed out the copy of the application and I have that information here, so I can provide that. Okay, do we want to get copies made and table this until we see the copies or? Um, I'm com I mean, I'm comfortable. So, I mean, okay. You got assurances everything's in there. I think we're fine. It's my okay. um, I'm going to vote against this trip and the next trip because I just feel like $3,300, $3,400, $3,100. This is like an elite, elite group of kids whose families can afford to send them on these trips. These are the only trips that seem to come to us. This is not like, it looks like an amazing trip. I'm sure like there's, it's obviously educationally viable, valuable, et cetera. But I just, and, and I get that it is very expensive to travel to Europe, um, but I just, I can't keep approving these trips that so few students can go on. My kids couldn't go. Um, and I just think it's, it's really puts parents in a tough position because when my kids go to the high school and they come home and they say, mommy, daddy, there is a school trip and they're going to France. It's going to be so <laughs> awesome. And the mommy and daddy in our family is going to say, yeah, it does look amazing. And there's no way we can afford to send you. And, and we will tell that to our children and that's part of parenting, but I'm, I'm ready to see some trips that are, um, accessible to more kids. So thanks. Anybody else? Dr. Ozenampi? I just, I, I agree with you that it's expensive, but it's also less expensive than taking the whole family to Europe. And so it can, for that reason, provide an opportunity for some people um, where they can't afford to do the whole trip, but they can send one kid. Um, but yes, it would be good to have trips that are more less expensive and also that have funding for people who can't afford it. Mr. Mr. Hainer. I agree with uh, Ms. Morgan on this. The, the fact that this is during non-school time for, for it to be brought before us, um, I see this being done in a private way and it, people could do it that way by having it in the school uh, or connected to the school indirectly through us and stuff. It does some people are not going to be there. We're not a private school system. We're a public school system. And there should be an avenue for every child to go there. We don't have funding problems. I've been told in the past, this GoFundMe. There are other ways to raise money and stuff. It hasn't happened. It just hasn't happened in the past. And there are kids that are not able to go. All right. Let me, yeah, let me make a comment first. Um, so I agree with what people have said. I mean, I think this is more of a a bigger policy question, right? Mm -hmm. So all we're doing is letting them promote this, mm -hmm. this trip on bulletin boards and through announcements, right? So this is not a school sponsored trip. It's just allowing them to promote it on school property. So if we want to decide as a policy not to allow that, then um, I don't know how else people are gonna find out, these kids are gonna find out about these trips, right? So. Um, uh, just as practically speaking, I think, you know, we've decided that we want to be able to review these trips, even though they're not school and <laughs> school sponsored, uh, yet we have a lot of criticisms about it. So I think as a policy question, um, it would be interesting to see what other school districts do in regard to these private trips, uh, and go forward from that. I would definitely be open to having our policies committee look at that. Did you want to say something, Doctor? Yeah, uh, I do. Um, it is true that the trips are expensive. We are looking to see if there are some other trips that would be within the United States. In fact, we have um, Mount Congress, for example, that's going to be coming up. But I will say that one of the things that I'm working toward is getting scholarship monies. We have, when students have applied for as much as even the entire trip, 
there is scholarship of money that comes out of the international fund. Um, Phil, that's a very appropriate way to support students in doing these trips. The other thing about it is that we're getting a calendar of trips so that eighth grade students can see what might be offered during their high school career. You're not going to be able to go on every trip, but there may be some trip that really would be important to you uh, for family reasons or interest. And if you were to see that there was one, it was going to be your junior year, for example, the French exchange or going to Japan in the summer, that you could, we, we, we want students to be able to take jobs and, and contribute to this. Um, and I, I think that a lot of our students do exactly that, that this is something that they want to do and they get support. So um, I, I want also to express my appreciation for the teachers that give up their time to be able to uh, allow our students to have these opportunities because they can be quite transformational. And um, it just opens their eyes to the world. The other thing I also want to point out is that something that you have approved is our global um, certificate that is, can be on students' transcripts. And one of the ways that uh, students can gain, gain credits toward that certificate is through travel. It's not the only way, and, and it's not, and it's, and you can certainly get the, you get the certificate through other means but this, but it is still a pathway toward that. Ms. Seuss? Uh, so, we, when I first got on the committee, we had a very extensive discussion on this, and I think um, the boat has somewhat sailed in terms of the types, offering these types of trips. I agree with everyone, both that it's very expensive, but also with Dr. Allison Ampey that it might be affordable for a family to send one kid to one trip, you know, once in the career. Um, but, but in our discussion five years ago, um, what we came to the understanding was is that these are, since they're not official school committee school trips, that um, our interaction with the trips had to be minimal. And that meant that they could not be promoted in a classroom, for example. And that was our sort of our, our agreement that we came to. Uh, we also at that time looked at ways to establish scholarships, which I know has been done. So there's been a lot of progress on this. I just want to sort of thread that needle carefully so that we would, so that this is something that uh, we an announce to our students, but we don't make it appear as if this is somehow related to someone's curriculum or sort of a necessary component to the <laughs> that it has to always be seen as separate. And that's why I think it's super important <coughs> that it not be printed in a classroom. Anything else? All right, is there a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Any uh, abstentions? Mm. And uh, opposed? Did you get that? So, 5 1 1. No, I, I, I apologize. I'm not abstaining. I'm, oh. Uh, I'm opposing. Opposed. Okay. 5, five 2. I apologize. No problem. Thank All you right. Very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And the next trip is the AHS science trip to Germany and Switzerland. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> uh, my name is Jason G. I'm a science teacher at the high school. And uh, last year, I ran a trip to Panama. We left a year ago tomorrow, or yeah, a year ago tomorrow and um, with EF, and it was a STEM trip as that uh, organization is starting to kind of grow their STEM programs. That trip was definitely transformational for the kids that were on it, and because of it, I was intrigued at exploring what other STEM offerings that they have. Uh, this year, uh, when I was planning, I was put a few different offers in front of me, me including Galapagos, but what I really wanted to explore was something that was quite different. And usually when people think science or a science trip it tends to be tropical or something along those lines. And with this one, it's exploring a location that is um, different from that idea. And what they're gonna be looking at is sustainable living, urban design, urban farming, urban planning, and bioreserves in the area of Germany and Switzerland. So it would be a three and a half days in Berlin, 
before traveling south of Germany to Friesburg uh, for a couple days, followed up by the Lucerne region in Switzerland, where the bioreserve is itself. Uh, the time spent in Germany will be looking at, as I said, sustainable design, among other types of urban planning. And what I'm really trying to pull from here is the idea of we are in a position kind of in our country, in our region, where we're trying to transform where we live, how we live, with greener technology, with sustainable living, to try to give ourselves a better future and give our kids a better future. So I would like these students to be exposed to ideas in other countries and other places that are taking steps forward. And especially in the upcoming years, as we rebuild the school, I think it will be insightful for kids to see how these are applied in other countries and how we're applying them here and what they can really take away from that. So that is the general gist of what this trip will be offering. Right, any questions or comments on this one? All right. Is there a motion? So moved. <laughs> Second? Second. All right. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. In a, any abstentions? And opposed? Okay. Also five to two. <coughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. G. All right. So next we have the superintendent's budget. Well, I want to begin um, this presentation this evening in um, thanking everyone who's participated to the point where we are right now, which is uh, a process that began months ago. Uh, we've had a lot of discussions within the administration. Uh, there's, been there's been some discussions at department levels and at the elementary school as well as we go forward and, not, and also um, with the budget subcommittee of this committee. When we talk about a budget for our schools, um, I think it's an opportunity for us to just take a moment to review what our mission is. It's, we don't do that very often. <laughs> and we begin this budget presentation as putting the mission of the Arlington Public Schools. And well, I won't read absolutely everything, um, the last line is really important, that the Arlington Public Schools are committed to helping every student achieve emotional, social, vocational, and academic success. And to that end, over many years, we've had a, a multi-system, a multi-tiered system of support, which a lot of our budget tonight is in support of. We've also, over the years, um, looked at sort of our portrait of a graduate, which is looking at what we want all students to know and be able to do when they graduate from Arlington High School. And we've looked at the, the knowledge, uh, uh, that are key to, we think, success both in life and in whatever vocation a student chooses. So we've looked at this as student as learner and as student as global citizen, which is sort of pertains a bit to our discussion earlier this evening. I'm not going to read through all of this, but I do want people to know that this vision um, is the result of a lot of discussion within the community, um, within, in forms that we have Vision 2020, there is a lot of, um, of people involved in it, not to mention all the discussions that went on with respect to the, uh, the new high school. So as we look at the budget priorities in, uh, this year, um, we're working to achieve this vision for all students. And 
as I mentioned, we do have a multi-tier system of support that includes um, special education services as well as reading and math interventions and social emotional support for our students, as well as um, the work that goes on in our high school guidance department for vocational career and career um, advice and support. So, but one of the things that has been true in the Arlington Public Schools for many years, and we've talked about this over and over, is the enrollment growth. And we continue to grow as a district. Um, you know, in the last 10 years, we've grown over 1,000 students. And, and this last year, we grew of 112, then this year, another 100, and, and it, it's continuing. And so our budget must reflect um, the needs just to address uh, uh, enrollment increase. So many of the positions that will are outlined in the budget um, represent uh, positions needed to address enrollment growth at the different levels. But they also um, are positions that we are adding to support these tiered levels of uh, that we tiered the level of support that we've been offering students in math intervention, reading intervention, special education, ELL support. And, and if I was to say the majority of the budget asks really fall in those, those, big, those big buckets. Related to enrollment growth um, is the size of our elementary schools. They have been growing. Uh, some of you on the committee can remember a time when our schools were in the 300s. We have one school in the 300s. All of our schools are in the 400s and two are over 500. And as you do this kind of work that we do in terms of deep dives into data to support um, decisions that we make, um, you know, meeting SST, uh, student support <coughs> meetings and students with IEPs, the number of meetings have been growing as the number of students grow. That we are finding that we need to have more administrative support at our elementary level. A couple of years ago, we added element, we added uh, uh, administrative support at the high school and adding new dean and um, we haven't done we actually now have three assistant principals at the middle school level whereas before we had two so currently we have four assistant principals they're part-time um, one is not uh, well actually two are not but that's because they they fill their position in a different uh, the other part of the position in a different way and so this budget is going to be looking at increasing uh, two more part-time um, so basically those are the big most of the issues but to um, miss Leary's question tonight about books and libraries what you will see is where we want to add another librarians uh, digital literacy specialist like it's, it's right now if you become a librarian you have that um, a, that kind of certification as well and you know as we increase the books in our library and as well so as we we support students in their reading the, the, this committee has been very supportive of this idea of having a librarian certified librarian in all of our schools and in the multi-year plan we we uh, keep looking toward how we're going to to, to uh, fulfill that. So this year we're adding one more, but as far as the books go, that is already in the budget. We didn't call it out because it wasn't an increase. It's already part of the, in a sense, the rollover budget from FY20. So at this point, um, this is a joint presentation with uh, Mr. Mason and myself, and he's going to talk about um, just the the finances of this, and then we'll come back to the, the uh, particular ask at each level. Good evening, school committee. <clears throat> um, so to develop the budget is, takes a lot of time, meetings, coordinating between multiple key stakeholders. Um, and our budget process really starts back in August. Uh, we work with the town. Um, which is not on the side because this is in terms of our operational budget, but we work with the, the town on the capital planning, and so we do have deadlines for that. Before this meeting, I came from a capital planning committee where it looks like all of our requests are going to be supported by the capital planning committee. Um, 
But then as a team, we meet in September, <laughs> starting in September, and those are a series of meetings that happen throughout this process and where we initially start talking about priorities and how we can try to improve instruction, looking at different data points to try to work on improving the achievement gaps. Um, and then later in October, as we meet with the budget subcommittee, some of you are part of those, that, that committee, um, to, to lay out the, the schedule on how we not only report to you guys, but our, the current financials, but how we are intending to roll out the budget. Um, and in addition, uh, we continue to meet with district uh, leadership and administration on, on the budget. In December, um, you got presentations uh, from the principals and as well as AEA uh, providing their requests, which was established part of the schedule. And as well as the school committee, some school committee members and district administration is meeting with long range planning committee and town governance to determine the budget targets, which then you vote on in January, uh, uh, in the beginning of January, which you guys accepted that number, which we'll discuss tonight. Um, and as well, at the around the same time is mid-January, we do get the preliminary governor's budget um, where they will inform the town of what we get for state aid, which we did have a couple of changes due to Student Opportunity Act. So I wanted to start going into the numbers where this is the funding sources and how it's been structured the last few years, um, where we're breaking out what the state aid has been, what the town contribution has been, which has been over the required foundation budget, um, and then how grants and revolving <coughs> funds, which are made, uh, mainly from fees that are collected for user fees for the buildings or student activities, uh, such as uh, music instrumental program fees, and then circuit breaker, which is another state aid, which is a reimbursement for tuition that hits certain thresholds for out-of-district tuition. So as you see on this, you'll see that, yes, that we have been in increasing in terms of our investment to the education, so we are committed to that here in Arlington. But on top of that, you'll notice that, yes, the state, the state aid has also been increasing and has increased about 14% from last prior year. So these are anticipated revenues. Uh, and so in terms of the fiscal 21, uh, for the town appropriation, the town appropriation, once again, that is that consists of what the town locally contributes from its tax base and what the state provides, which based on the, 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 the formula that we have between the long range plan, I mean, the town and the school department, um, which includes a, a growth rate factor of 50% of a per pupil deci average, and uh, set percent increases for general education and special education, we are getting $76,030,531 in fiscal 21, um, which is an increase of about 4.6 million or 6.44%, which is great that we're able to do that this year. Um, grants are hard to project. They've been trending downward. Um, so we level fund grants. Um, sometimes we do get increases of grants. So we'll wait and adjust when we get those final numbers. Um, the circuit breaker, uh, we're, we're actually spelling out because due to all the, the great work that we're doing, bringing in, bringing back our students, in some cases to be able to provide more services in district. Um, that means that we're not paying out as much out of district tuition, which are not meeting those thresholds to get reimbursed. So we're seeing an actual reduction in circuit breaker. And that this circuit breaker revenue actually comes this year. So we do have a cushion where we're, the money that we collect this year will be used to and applied for next year. And so that's a reduction of a 377,000. <coughs> And our total revolving and other reimbursements um, were actually increasing from 1.4 million to 2.1 million this year. Um, and part of that is to offset, to try to remain committed to special education, to maintain our local maintenance of effort. Um, so we're increasing, we have a, a, a revolving fund that we use for tuitions that we collect for services that we provide for out of the students that are not from Arlington. And we're gonna use that towards special education to offset the loss in uh, the circuit breaker. 
Um, and, in, and on top of that, we are going to increase the use of the building rental fees to keep up with the cost of utilities. We wanted to do this in a phased manner. We didn't want to just shock the operations budget and not be able to do some of the proposed additions. So we're doing $250,000 of increased spending over what we normally do on uh, building rentals facilities. And as well as we're doing additional $175,000 on foreign exchange tuition to support curriculum materials and professional development um, to support stronger instructional uh, support for our students. <laughs> so the total grand change in funding is $4.9 million, which is about 6.34%. Everybody kept up so far? <laughs> All right. A, great. So this chart you normally get, and uh, this is a, a chart shows, which shows the obvious. Town appropriation is most of the dollars. But what it doesn't show is the, the portion that we, we don't see is there's a state aid portion, which is about 19%. So about 22% of our money is from the state, 72% is locally contributed, and 3% comes from grants, which can be not as predictable, and another 3% that's been pretty steady has been from revolving. Bless you. And then we take the same 82 million total budget and we break it out into the, the voting categories. Um, so as you, as you may know is that we break out our, our, the budget transfer categories that the school committee limits our, our, our budget on based on administration, curriculum instruction, elementary education, grants, the other category which includes facilities, uh, transportation for regular education, um, as well as information technology and other indirect services secondary education for the high school and middle schools, and special education. Special education is what we are largely budgeting for, is the largest, followed by secondary and then elementary education. As some of you may know, um, Arlington has a, a town manager 12 that it compares to similar towns that meet certain criteria. And once again, not much has changed. We're still in the middle of the pack on the per pupil spending according to the latest data that's available for fiscal 18 per pupil expenditures, just to get an idea of where we're at. And w maybe some of the movements that we're doing will help us, but we'll see how that plays out in the future years. But to recap, our, once again, the total net increase is $4.9 million for all funds, not, not just the town appropriation, that's town appropriation revolving funds and grants. And you know, it would be nice to use that all for ads, but there are certain things that we have to do, right? So off the top, we do have to take $2.6 million for contractual salary increases, non-union salary increases, and, and um, bargaining unit increases, such as the teachers, um, as well as we were spelled out in the budget is we're dedicating, we're making dedicated art and music um, budget supplies. So instead of increasing principal supply budgets and leaving it at the discretion of the principals, we wanted to make sure that we're providing an equitable programs for art and music across the district where we're allocating a per, on a per pupil basis based on enrollment through the district, as well as additional funding for some information technology increases in software that will be implemented district wide. Um, the $175,000 that I've already previously discussed, that's going to be coming out of um, f um, foreign exchange, which is for the additional curriculum materials and professional development to help improve instruction. And then the increasing utilities on both the town appropriation, which is a, a little bit over $200,000, and $250,000 dedicated to, um, I'm sorry, th over about $300,000 increase of utilities on the town appropriation fund and $250,000 that will be um, focused on the revolving fund. Um, and to, 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 I want to be clear that we're, the, the, the use of the revolving fund is not necessarily an increase in collection of fees, it's that we've benefited with some balances that we, ne we need to spend down so that we're going to be increasing the spending out of those, those accounts. As well as you know that we're going to be getting a new high school uh, and so the high school project will be starting 
in a few weeks just starting breaking the grounds. So um, when, it, when it starts getting really busy out here, we wanted to remove the preschool from this, op this area, this operation, and have it's a dedicated location at the Parmenter School. But with that, there is operational costs um, that are mainly tied to facilities. Um, there will be an increasing of, uh, of a custodian to service that building, to help with snow removal, cleaning services, any issues that happen on site. Um, it will also include any utility costs for that building, which is, you know, it uses oil heat, is not anything that's mo more modern or efficient. Um, and so we estimate about $180,000 just to build into the operational budget for that program. Um, for those programs. And then in order to be able to meet and serve the needs of the students that are coming in district or that as the, the growing population or, or the, the students that have special needs in, in district, um, we're reallocating tuition that was normally for out of district placement to, um, to some of these ads. And so the total availability for ads this year is $1.6 million. And I'm gonna leave it to Dr. Bodhi to continue that discussion. Yeah. The, yeah, the elementary up there. Um, some of the, <laughs> uh, the you see, part, you see point fives and point twos. So oftentimes in these, in these proposals, this is um, moving someone to a full-time position uh, in order to, to meet the needs there. I, for example, in the math coach, that again, one of the things that we've been able to do over the last few years is move toward dedicated math coaches at the elementary level, but that doesn't mean that they're full time. And so this point five actually sort of spread out in a bit in order to, cre to create more um, time availability of the coaches for teachers. Another one here uh, is the math interventionist. Um, we're going to be able to actually make it a whole, but from a, you know from uh, by reducing something else in the budget in order to make up the point three. But right now we have uh, four four schools have some level of math intervention. So the math interventionist works directly with students. A math coach supports the teachers in their instruction. And what this is going to do is allow us to have every school have some level of math intervention support uh, for, a, you know, a, a, in their tiered level of a support <laughs> approach. We also, this, this English language learner teacher, actually we've already hired this person in the last month, so the, the FY21 budget needs to reflect that salary because it is not in the, the base budget. And then, as, again, as our number of students with uh, IEPs increases, this halftime team chair is for Thompson, which has our largest number of students with IEPs. The inclusion reading teachers, um, this, is, uh, this is going to be a very helpful addition to the work that we're doing with early literacy. As you know, this year we had a schedule, we were able to change our schedule that allows for at each grade level uh, that you could be teach, you could have in English language, um, uh, your reading program, your foundations, just your ELA program at the same time, same thing for math. The advantage of that is that it gives the opportunity to be able to have specialists come in and do push in, work with flexible groups, flexible groups within across the whole grade. But right now, in order to uh, service the reading needs, we don't have enough reading teachers to both do the tier two and tier three pullouts and be able to do some push in. So this is going to allow us to be able to do, um, do that. And the, the principals when they were here in December talked about this, but they have really gotten down to exactly what they feel they need for next year. As we move to the middle school, virtually everything in this is due to enrollment growth. Um, right now, what's, what's going to happen next year is that the seventh grade at the middle school is going to increase roughly about 50 students. Uh, the students that are in the sixth grade currently um, 
have close to 490 students. We expect that's going to go up a little bit. But we have five learning uh, communities at Gibbs. At, at Otteson, we have four in the seventh grade. And so we're going to increase 50 students. So the proposal by the principal, a very conservative approach, is just to add a half learning community, which we have done in the past. It means that the two teachers in that learning community are duly certified. Um, there is also a need for more sp another special education teacher. And again, with our, our tiered level of support, we have uh, math support both at Gibbs and at Odison, and that's increasing those positions to full time. And then the <coughs> Spanish teacher at Gibbs and Odison, again, is enrollment growth and class size. Same thing with physical education teacher. When we move to the high school, pretty much all of this is enrollment driven as well. Um, I, I think the high school would like to actually have more, uh, more uh, FTEs in this, but as we balance all the different needs of the district, this is what we feel that we can offer next year. Uh, this would meet their base needs uh, going into the next year. And as you can see, some of it is, again, in special education, and as well as we need to have uh, another ELL teacher. One of the things that we're seeing happening more is that we are having students coming in uh, that, that are um, immigrating or, or, or are having interrupted education so that they are coming in at levels that doesn't even match our intervention classes. So we are creating more opportunities for these very small group interventions. That's what you're seeing at the, the middle and the high school. At the district level, uh, we're putting in three reserve positions, as we've been doing the last couple of years, um, and hoping. But it, it looks like we may be, we potentially might need uh, teachers at two elementary schools, but we'll have to wait and see on that. This next one, uh, social emotional, I'll, I'll be really honest with you, this is really a placeholder of money for a position that we haven't, we haven't completely defined, but we know that we need. As you, as you've had a, dis, um, aware of the lab report, it has a lot of suggestions that are general ed suggestions, really more than special ed. And um, you know, getting consistency in our SST process, but we also need more support with social emotional learning and how we set up uh, the cultures in different schools. So we are working on. Uh, what that is going to look like. And before we actually ask you to vote on the budget, we'll um, give you something a little bit more of a recommendation, specifically what we're looking for. And it may involve a job description that will need to be approved. Um, and then we talked about the librarian. This is where it is. It's at the district, uh, district position, even though the intent is that that position will probably be servicing only elementary <coughs> schools. Um, and then again, it's, we're, we, we've talked in the past about um, one way to increase our physical therapy support is actually to use a therapy assistant. And that's, um, we have had requests both from teachers as well as principals to have more support, behavioral support, um, and that's what the BCBA request is. We also need uh, another bus driver. Uh, to transport special education students. This is this has been needed just by the way we've been shifting the preschool to Parmeter and change in start times. Uh, when our director of transportation looked at all the runs, he couldn't do it with our existing um, our existing staff. And then we are also increasing our uh, behavior support personnel at the um, in our special programs. So this is sort of a, a, a look at where we are. Again, you can see that this is enrollment driven. It is also tiered support driven, as well as some some vision of what we want, where we want to move over the next five years. So that concludes our report. Except that the major dates that are coming up, <clears throat> we're going to be having the public hearing on the budget at your next meeting, the 27th. Uh, and we need to have a vote on the budget from you by March, on the March 12th meeting because we, we took basically the last time that we could present at the Finance Committee, which is March 23rd.
and then we go to town meeting. Uh, March, so probably 7.30. We'll get up Maybe from they start at 7, I think. 7? 7. seven. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, do you want to talk now about the Student Opportunity Act? Sure. In relation to the budget? Yes. Um, the Student Opportunity Act is an act um, by the le legislature that you're all aware of that provides additional money uh, to support really a multi-tiered system of support, um, um, really targeting our students that are not uh, uh, achieving at the same level as our aggregate, our, most of our students. And we have identified what those groups are. In fact, we had a presentation about that in the fall when we looked at our MCAS data. But our MCAS data isn't the only data that we look at in terms of knowing w which students need more more support. So uh, when uh, the, the, in the governor's budget, uh, the amount of money that Arlington will receive is $2 million. But what, you un what the public needs to understand, I know that you know this, that the money comes into the town in Chapter 70 and then becomes part of the general appropriation to the schools, which we have agreed in terms of a formula in how that money is distributed. The Department of Education and the state legislature are requiring plans for how the $2 million would be spent in, in support of our students that have been struggling um, more than, um, are not achieving the same level as the majority of our students. But what the Department of Education also recognizes is that districts have been doing this work and that you're not starting from scratch, and we're not. So $1.5 million of that can be identified in terms of ongoing efforts. And there are certain commitments you need to make um, and decide where the focus of your, of your uh, energies and monies are going to be directed at. For Arlington, it's, it's what we've been doing. Uh, we're looking, as you know, at early literacy. And that's a goal. We're, um, we're looking at f professional development, uh, both in content and in pedagogy and in cultural uh, competencies, because the social-emotional uh, environment in which students learn is a, has a profound effect on their learning. And the state recognizes that, as does the legislature. Um, there are even suggestions on how you can change your schedule to create more planning time for teachers in this effort, which is exactly what we did this year. And so the monies that were we used to do that can also become part of our ongoing efforts. So we, this plan to the Department of Education is required to be submitted by April 1st. In fact, for 6 o'clock, I think, on April 1st. And... Uh, you, as a school committee, also need to approve the plan and be involved in the planning of this. So we're sort of on, a, uh, on a, an accelerated planning schedule in that we're going to be reaching out to um, our teachers, uh, reaching out to the public, uh, and, and because that's part of the requirements is to have input into what we're into our plan. And of course, the work we did in the five-year plan really is part of this. Um, that was definitely an outreach to people in terms of what we're looking to achieve over the next uh, five years. So we, we, we actually are, as, as this is unfolding and I'm learning more about it, we are actually in a very good position in terms of what we've been doing, what we're planning to do, and um, the outreach we've already done, and we can do more outreach over the next few weeks. So we're working on uh, the the basic the, the basics of it. We'll be coming back to you in, in the subcommittee and with the goal of moving toward your last meeting in March for approval of the plan. But I, I think you already can see where this where this plan is, and it's it's a question of how we, you know, just articulate it. They're looking for brevity. Uh, not long narratives, which is good. Of course, they have 300 and some to read so <laughs> and comment on, so that's probably part of it. But they have a very uh, 
strict format. They're going to send us templates mid-March that we fill out. So it's a, it's a very um, structured plan, planning process. And the takeaway at the budget subcommittee meeting was that there probably won't need to be any adjustments made to the budget as a result of the SOA plan. Obviously, that's not finalized yet. We have to go through public participation and all that. But as of now, it's not looking like we'll need to modify the budget to adapt to the, the, mm -hmm. the initiatives that we're thinking of putting in the mm -hmm. SOA plan. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Sickman? Okay. On the SOA plan to begin with, the state said there was a threshold of $1.5 million. Any community who was above 1.5 had to do the long form. Anyone below 1.5, short form. Mm -hmm. Now, most districts in the state got a $30 per pupil increase. We got significantly more. The reason why we got that was not because of the needs of our populations, because the Chapter 70 formula uh, caps the minimum local contribution so that the increasing enrollment is what's generating the additional Chapter 70 funds and putting us in, in this category. Uh, I'm on the AAC, uh, and we've talked about this. The state, uh, DESE, is, was kind of surprised that the legislature is requiring this plan the first year of implementation, given that the uh, Chapter 70 money was first announced in the governor's budget late January, and the and DESE didn't really have an infrastructure for playing with this as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, Commissioner Riley seems to be a reasonable guy who wants mm -hmm. to uh, uh, have uh, school departments and school committees doing good work for kids rather than generating paperwork and bureaucracy. So that that's sort of the context of this. Um, getting off SOA and into the budget, if I can hit a couple of questions. Um, starting at page 12 of the budget book, um, all the revolving fees and reimbursements are budgeted numbers. Do we have actuals around here someplace? Actuals for, for, for the actual the, uh, revolving re For example, the athletic fees are steady $260,000 mm -hmm. across the five years. I'm sure that we weren't <coughs> taking in exactly $260,000 each of those five years. Correct. Yeah. yeah. I, it, so the actuals. I, so, well, these were budgeted funding. This is not necessarily expenditures. So this is terms of revenue. So, mm -hmm. if, I mean, we don't show the actual revenues in this particular schedule. It has never been shown as such. So we kept it as the way it was. Would you yeah, like to see I'd, that? I'd like to see the actuals. I'd okay. like to know what we're dealing with here. Mm -hmm. uh, because if we're putting the same number in the budget every year, mm -hmm. I don't know if, if we're really close or far apart or, uh, you know, it, you're, you're asking us to approve the budgetary number mm -hmm. without have seeing the, the track record over yeah. the years. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, and seeing that, you know, we're talking about $260,000 worth of athletic fees, which the community is involved in, plus or minus what the actual is, you know, th that's something that people talk to us about mm -hmm. uh, quite a bit, actually. And, uh, and I'd like to see how that lines up. Uh -huh. uh, secondly, while we're on athletics, could we, for before we adopt the budget, get a cost estimate for adding a ski team? I think that the proponents of it have, you can say what the number was, but one of the things that Mr. Macy and I talked about the other day is that there's other costs mm -hmm. that are not represented. For example, mm -hmm. um, if, we're, if this is going to be a public school sport mm -hmm. and a student can't afford skis, mm -hmm. do we say you can't be on the team because you don't have skis? Now, in some sports, people do, for example, hockey, they usually buy their own stick, but we do mm -hmm. provide sticks when a student cannot mm -hmm. afford it. There are things that we are just part of the uniform we pay for. Mm -hmm what would that be, the helmets? I mean, there are things that mm -hmm. need to be thought about. Mm -hmm. So while there was an estimate, I don't think that is the accurate estimate Well, that's cost. why I want our number. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't, I no. can't give you one right now. No, I, I don't yeah. expect one right now, but we, I'd let's, like, let's to, work like on to see one between now and the time we adopt the budget. Mm -hmm. Because when I hear that we have a couple of kids who would have qualified for the state, 
uh, but we couldn't send them because we're not a, not a team or a club. I think we're taking an opportunity away from kids, and if we're that good, we should make it a team. Um, this is a masterful document. I think this is a very well done budget. Um, uh, my other question is, because it was raised out front, I think it's a reasonable question. Do we have set asides for library books in the budget? Correct. So that was an ad last year. Uh -huh. So we wouldn't put it, we, unless we're increasing above that mm. amount that we were allocating, is not being spelled out because of that reason. It's already built so into it, the budget. So it's somewhere buried in the materials and supplies? Correct. Once again, in the curriculum and materials, we usually use for the one-time purchases on the revolving funds. Mm -hmm. That's where they're coming out of. So we did the same thing this year. We'll mm -hmm. do the same thing again um, in fiscal 21. So if we set it, the, the library books aside as a line item, there would be sort of an expectation that that would be spent on library books as mm -hmm. opposed to other books. Correct. Um, uh, it, what would come back to us as an assurance that some of the town money is going to buy books for libraries? How do we know that? Well, basically you would get that information when we report on the end of year report. So um, there is a line section that we report for end of year and it would actually be reflected under our revolving funds where we're funding that. So when, we, when, I, re, when I do report on the fiscal 20 expenditures, you would see it there. And I'd like to comment, I mean, in terms of the logistics to, to clear up that, we are actually in the process of ordering. I think that when you're putting all the purchases of the district mm -hmm. over a certain amount, you have $5,000 per school, mm -hmm. um, it hurts certain thresholds. So it does take time to actually put it out to vendors to actually look at things for three quotes to make sure we're getting the best pricing and we're following the procurement laws. And so that's where we're at just to, to give updates. So hopefully those orders will be placed shortly. I understand those complications as a yeah. school person, but you know, uh, the one thing I'd like somehow during the process of either the budget process or during the school year is some sort of an acknowledgement of money that we're putting into this because for so many years we didn't. And, mm -hmm. and I think this is something we should be celebrating yes. uh, even for 30 seconds in one page or one place in the budget mm -hmm. because the, I, I think we could be proud of this. And if I could say, I will uh, let I will notify you on the when the monthly reports show that actual expenditure. Okay. That, great, great, fit. thank you. Can I have a, a comment to that? Sure. Um, I, I think we're we're definitely moving forward with mm -hmm. it. It's different when PTOs buy books. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's uh, that's um, outside. Yeah. But another mm -hmm. part of this, which is uh, do, is our, our new librarian has been very helpful. We're trying to do audits. Um, of the different libraries and um, our vendor has been helping us with that mm -hmm. so that there's also the issue of equity of opportunity mm -hmm. of what is available and so you might have some schools which have purchased a lot of books in one particular area mm -hmm. but not in another mm -hmm. and so we're trying to use the money that's coming from the district to uh, create equity among our libraries. And I think it's gonna take a couple of years to do, well, several years to do that, but that's, mm -hmm. that's the effort going forward. I, I very much appreciate that. Ms. Seuss? Uh, so yeah, on librarians and library books as well. Um, so I, I do think it makes sense to just call it out in this budget, just because it's so new and there were snafus, and you just say, well, we are continuing to do this. And, in subsequent years, you don't have to, but it just it's helpful, I think, mm -hmm. to the community. Um, so in terms of equity then, is then, are we going to have a minimum um, distribution of $5,000 per school, but then for the schools that have a depth, you know, are, are not as well stocked, they get more, or do some schools get less? It's what, they, it's what they use the 5000 to purchase. Okay, because there are some schools that are in much better shape than others. And Correct. I have to say, mm -hmm. it used to be Thompson that was in the worst shape, and with the amazing generosity of the town and of um, uh, Elaine Shea and, and that family, um, that mm -hmm. looks fabulous, right? So, so Hardy is now the next sort of school that's sort of in, in the worst shape, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so we might want to look at, at one-time expenses at some point. Mm -hmm. When we've, you know, added librarians who've been thoughtful about the collection, I think it's hel helpful to, to maybe sort of look at equity across the district among schools. Because there may be beginning Some schools are just a yes. lot better funded mm -hmm. than other schools. Historically, mm -hmm. there are PTOs mm -hmm. that have had a lot more money, mm -hmm. 
and they've just spent, you know, mm -hmm. some, some PTOs raised three times as much as other PTOs. And that's just what we've seen. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I have a question though also, the librarian, how is this librarian going to be used? Are they sort of, are the two librarians at the elementary level working together? Or is one going to be more specialized for the middle school level? Well, the current librarian also has a teaching assignment, um, as does the new digital literacy. One of the ways that we are able to do this common planning time, which the, the, at each one of the elementary schools, is to be able to have okay. coverage of the classes. So the, the new classes. librarian will do that as well? We would, right, the, we, we would have to figure out what that different schedule would be so there'd be more um, free, free up a little bit. We'll figure out whether, you know, we assign four schools, which is what we did initially with coaches. We had four and then the other, the other three. One of the issues we may, we may need to ass assign <coughs> some to the middle school. What, while the issue of in increasing librarians is another aspect to this that we've become educated about, and that has to do with our databases. And in order to have these databases um, available to all of our schools mm -hmm. free, um, is that you have to have you have to have a point to certified librarian for each school. Mm -hmm. So by adding a 1.0, it's actually 0.2 more than we need, but that we're, we weren't going to quibble on that. Um, in order that then all of our schools would uh, fit the criteria for having these free databases. Okay, so there's going to be instruction at all of the schools. It sounds There'll like. be there has been instruction okay. at all the schools, okay. and and the more support we have, the more they, they might even be able to get into classrooms. And and we're, this is not affecting uh, our paras. Our paras are doing a great job, but okay. there are a lot of things that we d need to do. We we're just talking about library books. Just looking at the collections and figuring out where are some holes that we need to have, mm -hmm. fill. I should say. Mr. H Mr. Hainer, uh, I'd like to commend you and the complete staff. I think it's a wonderful book. That being said, page five, the second to last line. Page five. It, it's uh, on the uh, facts and figures. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The teacher-student ratio uh, in the past, when this was published, I've asked for a, at least a, an asterisk to explain that uh, you take the student population and divide by all licensed people. That would include Mr. Mason, the superintendent, the nurse, to get the, we do not have classrooms of 14 to one on an average throughout the district. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the way Desi's been doing it. Right. it. It's just, to me, very misleading. And I've asked in the past, I'd like to see an asterisk put there uh, just to, explain where this comes from so people realize that we do not have classes of this size and the right. teachers are underworked and overpaid. Mm -hmm. That's all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We're underpaid. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Uh, old people need the help, all the help we can get. We all do. <laughs> hey, Dr. Austin Ampey. It's working with okay. Um, Okay, so I have a couple com comments and then some questions. Um, first, regarding the SOA, um, the other thing that came up at budget subcommittee was that we were making, ensuring that the SOA requirements could be fulfilled <coughs> within the current town allocation, which when we were first hearing about the change, you know, the, the expectations and how much we were getting um, was at least to me a little bit of a concern, but, but they can, and so that's great. Um, and the clarification that I wanna make, while I appreciate the chart that you have that shows the chapter 70 okay. amount, people need to understand that in Arlington, the chapter 70 does not come directly to the schools. Mm -hmm. And so any increases, such as I was just speaking about where we're, the, the chapter 70 coming to the town is increasing by almost 2 million this year, um, does not correlate to an increase in our budget of that amount. Um, 
it, I'm a little concerned that that chart kind of makes people maybe think that or, or I think it'd be good to have something in there just making it very clear that this is sort of of intellectual interest but really all the money comes into the town and then the town portion is out and the advantage of doing that is one it gives us stability over multiple years of knowing what our funding is mm -hmm. um, and two if chapter 70 goes down as it has in the past the town has made up our difference mm -hmm. whereas if we were writing the chapter 70, we would have been doing this right um, okay so now my questions first um, I'm a little confused about the librarians I had thought well, uh, just the general idea uh, yeah um, I had thought from last year's discussion on about the five-year plan and stuff that we were talking about adding combination library and digital uh, literacy specialists and so this is listed as a librarian or it, it does media specialist mean digital what do you see what I'm saying yeah. I'm, I'm confused what we're adding you know what we had talked we're about adding and a, what we're actually adding we're adding a librarian with digital literacy skills okay um, and that's how the job description okay. is that that's for the position and we and we want that too um, and if, and in fact anybody who's coming out of that certification today has all of that yep. one of the things we found last year is because we were so late in uh, advertising we really did not find the second person we thought we would uh, have, but we really needed a person to help with all the teaching that we were going to do this year to, you know, for the planning block. So we did hire a digital media specialist. That person is not a librarian, but, but still a, a needed skill. What we think with having, hiring a librarian is we get a twofer. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm just thinking it'd be good to put that in the description when we're talking about it so that people understand because I think it's something that parents are interested in okay um, and understanding we can, that we, we are covering that. those bases mm -hmm. too <coughs> then um, on page 10 of the budget book um, the paragraph that starts or it talks about um, the first paragraph I think has some errors in it and we can talk about this offline it, it, mm -hmm. it there, there's mm -hmm. I can't explain on camera um, but that should we should probably get that fixed um, then on page 17 uh, there's a statement that says enrollment growth means that it, it's explaining why we were adding some of the things it, it's a footnote it says enrollment growth means that Arlington is no longer considered a low incidence ELL district and I'm confused by that statement because enrollment growth in, in if the incidence stays the same the, yeah if the percentage the percentages you're talking yeah. about yeah yeah I'm saying that the percentage shouldn't be changing now it may be that it's changing but that's it could. It, the, you I see, think it, it's it two different something else. things. Yeah. I'll double check that, but I think it has to do with the number of students you have. But I'll double check that. Okay, so it, it maybe just be the actual. So low incidence really means number of students, not percentage. Because yeah, the number the number of students needing special ELL services has increased. But what has also increased <coughs> is 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 much. I shouldn't say as much, but both things are going on the number of students as well as the needs of these students okay um, and then finally one last comment um, I just wanted to call out to everyone who's watching us that this budget book um, is now being really put into the format from the from ASBO um, which is based on the meritorious budget and it has a different look it has a different feel um, it's not you know this is our first this is our next big move towards uh, improving the budget book and I think it does it I like it yeah, it, it, 
Yeah. Uh, it's professional. It looks, you know, there, there's some things to start tidying up, but I think it was a big, mm -hmm. it, it's a big change, mm -hmm. and I think it's definitely towards a positive, mm -hmm. and I commend you all for doing mm -hmm. the work to make it possible. Yeah. There's a lot of credit to yeah. Mr. Mason on this. Miss <laughs> <laughs> Morgan? Um, I think it's beautiful. I think that the slides mm -hmm. and the book talk to each mm -hmm. other and that fills me with joy. I love, mm -hmm. it does, no, like I, I, mm -hmm. I do, I, it makes me feel so happy. I love that I can look at this ad here and it has a number in the row and then I can move forward and read the narrative mm -hmm. about that particular edition. Mm -hmm. And um, so I really appreciate it. I think that's a couple of the um, pie charts in the presentation speak to Dr. Allison Ampey's concern. And I do, I think mm -hmm. it's really tricky, this whole like mm -hmm. relationship between chapter 70 mm -hmm. and the town appropriation and, and we're getting there. Mm -hmm. It feels close and these two pie charts and, mm -hmm. and, and it's, it's really, really, we're really close mm -hmm. to being able to talk about it spot on. So I think that that's exciting and I do mm -hmm. think that that's important. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. anyway, thank you. Mm -hmm. Matt. Um, sure. In the long range planning uh, spreadsheet that we have, it actually, chapter 70 is mm -hmm. called out. So, what that means is that if chapter 70 goes up, some other monies can be either put off into the stabilization mm -hmm. account, mm -hmm. and that's t to the point the, of stability, which I, th mm -hmm. I think Arlington has done an amazingly good job. In fact, people reach out to find out what Arlington does about this because it, 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 mm -hmm. it has done such a great job in terms of stabili stabilizing budgets. Mm -hmm. Mr. Thielman? So my, my uh, great job on this, mm -hmm. it really is a, 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 a big step forward. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that we committed to do in the uh, operating override uh, that we're not doing anything? And I mean, maybe, I mean, is, I don't know if you know that, Lynn, or if there's anything that we're, Anything that we're not able to do in this? Uh, so, I mean, we didn't really commit to anything. I know that. I, I, yeah. know. <laughs> I, I understand. There's that, some positions but, that are So, if, if you look at the, the five year, year plan, plan that right. it use, if you use that as the measure, yes. Yeah, that's, um, that's what I, what I mean, meant. partly is we don't have enough funds to cover everything. So, yeah. we're doing everything slow, more slowly. Um, you know, the one major item that uh, Ms. Morgan pointed out is that there was uh, funding in the plan for additional staffing in our SLC programs. Yep. And as Ms. Elmer said at the last meeting, the enrollment growth has not occurred there. So that has not been needed yet. So that's still not funded. Um, there are other special education positions that are being funded, just not in the SLC programs. Mm -hmm. That's really the main thing that I think sticks out. I don't know how much we've been increasing curriculum Expenses. It doesn't. It's not clear to me that there is an increase in curriculum expenses other than the, the, the art and music mm -hmm. item. That was going to be one of my questions. But um, so I mean, I think it, this may be a, this is this. it could be a question that'll come up at town meeting. Somebody wants to, Somebody asked me this, and I said, you know, you got you to ask Len Card and that guy. Well, uh, let me piggyback on a comment that, that you made in that. Yes, our SLC is not necessarily going on. As you can see, the success we're having out of district. And honestly, I really want to credit our teachers in the district who are doing so much, you know, are really reaching out to a much more inclusive environment. But also the money that we've been putting in every year iteratively more into interventions, uh, math support, coaching, um, reading, all of these things are now really starting to show and you're seeing it, and it, at first we were going, wow, this is, because we actually looked at the numbers, we went, wow, this is really a change, and now it's a sustained change for two years. Now, one of the things that we haven't done, because we've been very purist about what considered special education increases, the, the, we've had this category of intervention. In fact, we've done, done that graph before. We just yeah. didn't put it in here as to how much we spend on interventions. And every year that, that, that percent goes up. And we, are, we really are seeing the effects. Um, and so we're definitely on the right track of what needs to be done. And in fact, when I saw the, um, the, what they call the 17 evidence-based programs the Department of Education was touting as districts to do, when I read them, I went, we're doing it. That's exactly <laughs> what we've been doing iteratively. And, it, and 
I think that you sometimes can't see it in a given year. You only see it over time. And that's what we're seeing in the numbers right now. Mm -hmm. Ms. Hughes? So actually, that was going to be um, a question about, um, so I know for a few years we did have in the pie chart this little slice that said these are the intervention money. And so you could see that even though we weren't spending as much on special education as we had historically, there was a clear visual sort of explanation for that. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if it makes sense to do that or if it makes sense to do it as yeah. a, mm -hmm. um, a bar graph as, as ever increasing numbers or mm -hmm. pu per pupil or mm -hmm. I, I wonder if there's just some way to, to convey that to the public. Yeah, we'll try to work on okay. a, uh, a visual aspect that is easily to explain yeah, I think that would be helpful because I mean that was part of our story. So it'd be, it'd be mm -hmm. like not great to drop it because if, if we can if we can convey that mm -hmm. information. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have a question. So I sit on the wellness committee, and I know that the way our budget process works, we often don't mm -hmm. hear from nursing staff. And I know a couple of years ago we heard sort of late, like oh my goodness, we didn't like realize that mm -hmm. the timing of the budget request and you know, really the numbers are getting such that we really need additional nursing. Mm -hmm. And I know that in this budget there isn't any. And so the question is, is that okay? Can we sort of slide by with the increases? I know we have, you know, ever increasing needs of individual students as well as just the, the sheer number of students are growing. Um, that was a request. Mm -hmm. um, and it, we also have to understand this is a blueprint. Mm -hmm. And when needs come up, we try to figure out how to, to staff when we, uh, uh, right. for example, the ELL teacher we had to staff this year at, at Stratton. Um, yeah, I think our nursing staff is, is a little stretched. Yeah. Uh, it's true. And I think here at the high school, when the middle, uh, preschool goes to Parmeter, that nursing position is going to go. Right. And so we've been staffing it, too, in the clinic. We, we also have... Um, I, I can talk more about this at another time, but we also have uh, another opportunity to get some resources uh, through some grants. And so we're looking at that as well. But yes, I, I think that that is an issue. Now, you, you put this in perspective, though. We still have districts in this Commonwealth that do not have a nurse per school. Mm -hmm. We have, there are, there are schools that do not have a social worker in every school. And this is something that as a, as a district and as a community, <coughs> we have prioritized. Mm -hmm. um, and we do have that. In fact, we, even at the elementary now, we have sometimes more than one social worker. So we have been investing in this. And if we find that we need to have more nursing, we'll figure out how to do it within this. Mm -hmm. All right, my turn, I guess. Um, so again, yes, congratulations on the revised presentation. There's a lot of good stuff. Um, I guess as a process matter, I mean, often we have feedback and things sort of get appended to the budget. Mm -hmm. But I think after the, our hearing um, at our next meeting, it might be useful to actually revise this document mm -hmm. yeah. and republish it before our March meeting right. yeah. um, with our input. And um, that just, yeah. you know, People agree, mm -hmm. yeah. nodding their heads. Okay. Um, you may get binders then, though. <laughs> okay. We don't have to actually print it for us, yeah, but um, just right. re republish it. Uh, uh, so, and then things I noted was to add the library books. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, we are we are reflecting spending out of the revolving funds, mm -hmm. um, and, and so we we didn't discuss the books in our budget last year. So even though we funded it, it wasn't discussed. So it would be useful to call that out somewhere. Okay. Um, and include that money somewhere, yep. uh, even if it's being funded out of those re revolving mm -hmm. funds. Um, and the interventions chart, adding that, if, would be, if you can put that together, would be good. Mm -hmm. So I had a couple of questions. So the, the team chair, I th certainly am supportive of, of reducing workloads. But based on the numbers from the state, which, which are older, mm -hmm. there are actually more students uh, at Stratton than at Thompson. Um, Is that, so that changed? Or? Yeah, I think, sorry. The um, numbers that we pulled live from in November, I think was the last time we pulled them, had it higher at Thompson. Okay, because it was 91 at Stratton, because the SLC is there with 30 kids, mm -hmm. and 77 at Thompson. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and they have an additional, it, I don't have the exact numbers in my office yeah. for what that currently is as of November, because those would have been October 10 numbers that mm -hmm. were, um, and just mm -hmm. frankly, the numbers that the state have don't always match yeah, up with what yeah. we have locally. Um, when we pull it directly from um, Easy IEP, which is our software for tracking IEPs, um, they're close, they're definitely, yeah. those are the two largest. Um, we also have the full-time um, assistant principal over at Stratton, which part of that 0. 0.5 mm -hmm. Dr. Bodie mentioned is for special ed support. Okay. And then um, uh, for Mr. <coughs> Spiegel, on our uh, bus drivers, it doesn't look like the contract requires them to be full-time, mm -hmm. right? So, so, um, so why is this a full-time position if they're just doing runs in the morning and the afternoon? Do we have to have them f work full-time? I mean, uh, I don't know. I'd have to ask our transportation director, but our bus drivers who do runs in the morning don't just, that's not all they do mm -hmm. um, during the day. They, they do, um, besides run, um, transporting students in the morning and the afternoon, they um, make deliveries between buildings. Um, they work on... Um, the, the buses and and, um, field and the field trips and yeah so the field trips are a big thing too that we tend we'd like to use our own buses and our own bus drivers if we can for field trips rather than going out mm -hmm. so the decision has been made we've had full-time bus drivers here in the district who work the full year as well I, I will say that hiring a bus driver is getting to be very Although, challenging I'm not sure if this one is a if he wants this one to be full year or just the... I think he only wants it to be the school year. He, 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 did, he did say that he would prefer if it could be full year, but if he couldn't be approved as not full year, it would be a 10-month job. And that was the, the request. Okay. okay. Um, and then on the, uh, the art supplies and performing art supplies, so certainly with art supplies, you know, I, there's actually materials, you see it on the walls here. Mm -hmm. what, what does the performing art supply budget cover? What kind of materials? And so, oh, yeah, I mean, it would, I mean, my understanding was there is some consumable materials that they do use, but there's also equipment that they would use in classrooms that are district-wide. Um, and yeah, by nature, it may not seem as though um, the expense is not as consumable as arts, but they're more expensive. It's not necessarily um, something that you would have to phase out each year to purchase to keep the operations going. So one school might get something one year, another school may get something another year based on the cost of equipment. And then you would create a rotating cycle because you would eventually re replace that equipment on, a, on a, a rotating basis to keep everything fresh. Okay, great. And then... Finally, the last question on curriculum. So that was that's the one item that um, sort of was in the in the five-year plan that um, we don't necessarily not called out, but maybe mm -hmm. we're increasing increasing it otherwise. But um, uh, so, well, I guess there's sixty thousand in here. Thirty. Um, mm -hmm. So. Is this actually more materials that we're purchasing, or, or? Yeah. So it is a ver it's a variety of between curriculum mm -hmm. like textbooks yeah. and additional instructional materials that could be uh, to, to <coughs> strengthen our instruction inside the classroom. Um, in addition to, it's not just curriculum materials that we're doing. We're also looking at different types of professional development to help improve instruction. Um, we do have a list of that. I mean, we can disclose that list. It was something that was separate, that we know that we can't fund all the requests that are on our list. Um, but um, when it's finalized, we can also Great. disclose that with the school committee. Great. And I'm just noticing that the, now the numbers actually don't line up. So there's 31 items in the so, list. So I'm going to explain that. So if you look at that total number, that total number is the net change on the town appropriation. All right, so if you look at the total change on that, it's 4.6. Yeah, yeah. As you notice that our total change is 4.9. And so part of that, the funding additions are supported through revolving, mm -hmm. and we do not uh, call out the revolving adjustments on that particular list. 
Oh, right, right, right. But but uh, the table lists 31 items, mm -hmm. right? But then in the narrative, something's just wrong. I, I'm just noticing this now. Oh, I, I don't, the, don't quite know what's wrong, but then the narrative oh, lists numbering is off. 32 okay. items. Okay, maybe there's something that's extra that needs to be released <laughs> that we decided. But that, thank you for noticing that. Yeah. I will adjust that and update on the digital document. <laughs> All right. Anything else, Dr. Allison Ampey? Um, I had two quick questions, um, both on page 26. First, line 6, 700, uh, curriculum and instruction leadership. There's an increase, and I was just wondering what that's for. Page 26. It's the first. Um, It's the first one of all the uh, curriculum instruction, CNI. I can get back to you, Kersey, on that. I believe that would be tied to um, possibly some professional development, but I will definitely get back to you on that question, okay? okay. And then on the same page, um, line 6854, the special education summer program, that uh, is funded at greatly reduced amount, and I'm wondering how come. Is that what you're calling it? 54. All right, I'll look at that reduction those are the as tuitions. well. Those aren't the summer, that's not yeah. ESY. Yeah, it's probably how it's coded in Munis and our financial system, and that's as a program code, but that's probably the reduction of the tuition. Mm -hmm. But I will confirm for you, because there's a lot of moving parts here. So the tuitions will come up in the summer program? No, it's not our ESY program. It's our students who attend out-of-district placements, and there's usually a separate, they separate out the summer tuition. Oh, tuitions. okay, okay. So it's like paying for summer camp. Yeah, I'm assuming separate. that's, I mean, that's yeah. not our okay. ESY I mean, budget. No. So I, I don't know the number. But. We might have reduced the wrong tuition line item. To, to to accommodate to to the the additions that we were talking about okay. to reallocate special education funding. Okay, but there's not like some major district initiative to shut down a summer no. I mean a summer program, which is no, what, no, what no, it no, looked like. No. Yes, but thank you for spotting that out. Yeah. Yes, I will okay. look into it to make okay. sure it's right. thank you. the right line. And we'll, we'll have a chance to go over it. We, we just got this on Sunday, so we'll have a chance to go over this again at our next meeting mm -hmm. after the budget hearing. Mm -hmm. All right, anything else? All right, great. On to the monthly financial reports. Mr. Mason again. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I was not at the last meeting um, due to a personal reading, so sorry about that. Um, but once again, these are your standard monthly reports. This was for the month ending in December, the last calendar month of 2019. Um, and this the report is showing that we currently have, as of that period, a surplus of 415000 And similar to last year, it's mainly driven by uh, special education out of district tuition. Um, so we'll be looking at probably setting some money aside for reserves just in case in the future as well, again, as we did last year. Once again, um, you also have the grant accounts report. We're drawing down funds as we normally should. Uh, so you'll see that some funds do not have necessary revenue drawn. They just have the 10% that they're given up front because some expenses are later in the year that occur. But um, as expenses occur, we then draw down funds for grants. And all of revolving accounts are in balance and going as planned currently. Um, if there's any questions that you had after reviewing the report from last meeting, I, I'd try to answer some if I know the answers right now. Otherwise, I would get back to you as well. Any questions on the monthly reports? Well, all right. Great. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Superintendent's report. I have a few things. I'll, I'll try not to. Keep your keep your keep it going strong for your. <laughs> um, so let me begin with the high school. If you could just put that up. Yes. 
We're moving into a period of time where you're going to start seeing things. It's going, it's going to be happening. Uh, this is the diagram for, there's different months as we go forward. We are entering the, and we've been in it, frankly, for the last, all the, for all the meetings we've had, in the pre-construction time. So there's a lot of things that have to happen before you can actually begin construction, which will not really officially happen until probably around October 1 next year in that vicinity. But uh, in, the, in this process of um, <coughs> beginning this, we need to, over the next um, month or two, figure out where people are going to park. So one of the things that's going to happen when we get into March is that the, the basketball area in the back is going to be paved, well it is paved, but it's going to be put in a way with the fencing and, and line, line, line um, putting numbers Sorry. on spots. This is going to be the temporary parking for the parking that's eventually going to um, be eliminated in front of the school and also along Mass Ave. So over uh, the basketball is one of the big issues of, of, that's going to be going on. Um, another thing that's already starting, we, we've been having people come look at this, is doing trial uh, borings for the geothermal wells. And there's going to be one that's done over in the practice field. That's the one that's over by DPW. Do we have a, do you have a clicker with a laser on it? Uh, I'm sure that will have a laser on it. I'm going to go from here. Maybe you could do it because you know um, the practice. We're going to do a boring over in the practice field, mm -hmm. and then over in the softball field. So beginning this spring, all of the fields are off limit except for Pierce. And so one of the things we're actually we we have <coughs> um, a, lot, a number of subcommittees of the of the building committee that meet. But there's one committee that is an internal committee because it's basically all of the, the nitty gritty is a transition phasing. So there's a lot, of, a lot of things that we're dealing with in terms of beginning the process of actually moving. Um, there's a lot going on with the Parmiter uh, building right now. Bids have just come in. We're looking at uh, some of the bid documents and perhaps negotiating about those. We have to do a lot of planning with respect to what the move, when the move is going to take place, what kind of boxes we're going to use. There's just a lot of things that has to be thought about in each aspect of this. But what will happen in March is that the circular drive in front of the school will still be operational, but we're going to beginning to start seeing fencing, and the fencing is going to start in April. And when, can we do the next, the next slide? Yep. When we put these in, they, they didn't come out in color. But what's going to start happening in April, we're going to start putting fencing around the area. Some of the trees on the inner part of the drive are going to, are going to have to come down. Um, the trees that are along Mass Ave, they will be fenced in by formula in terms of the diameter of the base, how far out the fencing will go. There's going to have to be along the front. Right now, the, there is a culvert that goes under the high school, and that all that water has to be re-diverted. So there's going to be a trench that's going to be dug in the front of the high school, six foot deep, in order to, to do a diversion on the culvert. Um, Sometime later in April, right down the middle of the front park is going to be a new driveway that will access some visitor parking on the right as you come up, but it basically you can only go left. So there still will be some drop off there, but everything to the right towards CVS is going to be off limits at least for several months. 
later on we'll get some pictures to show you of what will happen in terms of the walkway that will be in existence. So we're, we're starting to move into a phase where there's going to be, uh, it's going to be noticed. There's going to start to have some inconvenience to people as they get used to this in terms of where you have to park, what door you're going to be coming in. Um, for students, I don't think you're going to see much, uh, you know, they're, they will notice that they're not walking up in, in April along the full circular drive. They'll be coming to the front of the school and walking in, but the front door and all the doors in front will be used as they are right now. Um, there will, as we start doing more geothermal, fortunately they're far enough away from the high school that the noise that those are going to generate are going to be... This up there? Pardon? You want this up there <laughs> with the pictures? Um, it shows sure. the arrows and everything of what Got you're the talking arrows. about. Yeah, when we scanned it, it didn't scan in as color. It's on the building project website. Mm -hmm. She has different versions, though. I have different. These yeah. are the most, these were updated last week. Gotcha. That probably is well, not. You say 2-4. Four. 2-4. Four. Oh, they say 2-4. Either from the forum. Okay. Right. It's not much yet. <laughs> all right. <laughs> next time, next meeting, the 27, we'll, we'll make sure all these are in color so you can see it a lot better. But uh, the, we had, a pan, we had a community forum on the 4th, which you're aware of, and we talked a bit about that. Uh, we're going to probably need to have a parent meeting uh, to talk about, you know, what's going to be happening, what students are going to expect. There will be meetings with the students themselves over the spring. Um, but it is, everybody's been hearing about the building project for for quite some time now, and now you're going to start seeing some of the changes that are going to be going to be happening. I think one thing that I do want to emphasize that came up before, um, and it came up again in the in some com comments that have come in, and also form, is that even though we've reduced the number of geothermal wells uh, down from what was originally estimated, we haven't changed the sustainability goals. We are going to accomplish very, very close in terms of the um, energy that we had planned from the, the larger numbers. In fact, there's a blog on the website that those that want to get into more detail about why that's the case can read. So it is, it is now starting to happen and um, uh, it's beginning in some, some earnest. So we'll, we'll talk more about that, obviously, every meeting in terms of what to anticipate over the, the next month um, and um, continue all the planning that's going to go on. Does anybody have any questions or, or, or do you want to add anything? The chair of the building committee is here. <laughs> no, I, I think, no, I think the committee's worked really hard and, you know, we're, we're, st we're still developing, um, you know, making decisions about exteriors and other things. And so there's mm -hmm. still work that we're working on. And, but I think the committee's worked really hard. The design team has worked hard. Kathy's worked hard. So <clears throat> we had a good forum the other night. I would say um, half the people there were abutters who had concerns about the project and half the people were, parent, were parents who had questions about what was going to impact their children. And probably we need to have a separate forum for right. parents. Mm -hmm. Right after that forum, when people were talking about um, some of these concerns, yeah, uh, one of the concerns, of course, was damage to their own homes. And yeah. it wasn't a couple of days later was that article on the front page of the Globe mm -hmm. about Needham. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. But at the forum, um, our owners, Skanska, did say that they were going to be taking pictures so that we we do this. And and you know, we, there's going to be a lot of care given. Mm -hmm. to not having that repeated and watching the decibel levels and the earthquake parts of this as we go forward. Dr. Lesnampi? Um Yeah, I saw the article also. <laughs> it was nice because at the forum they talked about how um, Skanska slash Consigli plans to be proactive looking at, at um, abutting homes and doing assessments and, and documentation before the fact, which was not done in Needham. Um, and so I think what they saw is not going to be our experience. The other okay. thing I wanted to point out is um, we, did, we had a nice turnout for the forum, but if anyone was unable to attend, we've got both mm -hmm. the replay from ACMI up on the website as well as all the um, 
presentations and, and uh, handouts and things uh, so you can see them in color and uh, look mm -hmm. at them. And then if there's any mm -hmm. questions, they can send mm -hmm. them onto the building committee. So I have one question slash suggestion. I mean, the idea of, I dropped my son off, I admit, I admit I'm adding to the problem, but, <laughs> but the number of people that have to pull into the driveway to get their kids just a little bit closer to the door is mm -hmm. a little bit ridiculous to me. And, <laughs> and, and putting a, the special driveway in the middle and having parents drive in there just doesn't seem like mm -hmm. a great idea. Um, they should be able to drop them off on Mass Ave. You need that driveway to access the parking, but. We, we, I, need it for, uh, we need it for emergencies too. We, we have the nurse's um, office still in the front of the building. What's going mm -hmm. to happen in September is the nurse's office is going to go to Down's house, where the, the you know where the playground mm -hmm. is in the back there. The circuit, that's where the nurse's office is going to go, and then any ambulance will come in on this uh, off of Mill. Mm -hmm. So we still need access until the end of the school year to the front door, for that reason. Right, we could put an authorized vehicle only. Yeah. We would we would prefer parents just drop their their son or daughter off on Mass Ave. Mm -hmm. Or if you're coming from the west side of town, maybe just drop them off the bank. There is a crossing, there is a crossing light there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, Dr. I, I, I just point out that it's not always drop off. <coughs> like just last week I had to come early and pick mm -hmm. my child up because from the nurse's office and, and that, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want, until we have to, it was nice not to make her walk across. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. But you're right, and we probably should keep mentioning that at the meeting, is that please, mm -hmm. just yeah. drop off a Mass Ave, or the, the back as you've done in the past. All right, um, a few other things. The, uh, we had a group of physics students that applied to present at the Learn Launch Conference, which is a major conference in Boston, and um, they were one of, you know, I think we had about 20, 20 groups of students from different schools, uh, and they're going to come at our next meeting to talk about their um, project, which had to do with um, inf studying infrared light. So I just wanted to, mm -hmm. to tell you that, and we'll honor them at that time. <coughs> For the second time in the last 10 years, the Arlington High School quiz team qualified to move on into the final 17, and the first televised um, round is going to be this Saturday, the 15th, at 6 o'clock on GBH, and they're up against Acton Boxborough. So there is a, the, on the high school website, there is a nice video that I would, high school parents or any parents and community members might want to see in terms of interviewing the students who are, who are on that team. So go AHS. <laughs> Uh, kindergarten registration began, and we had a, a large turnout as expected during that first, uh, it will continue, and it will continue until mm -hmm. forever, uh, honestly. But one of the things we did say to people is if they were in that January 22nd to 28th, mm -hmm. they would, anybody who was in a buffer zone would have mm -hmm. the, the, same, the same place on the list. There was no, in fact, there was no list. And we went through and did all the buffer zone assignments. Mm -hmm. um, and sent, that's all been sent out this week. Mm -hmm. We'll continue to do that. We, we want to make sure that all the parents uh, know mm -hmm. that if they apply to the after school programs by 6 p.m. on March 2nd, they are um, on equal footing with every other parent mm -hmm. for a placement. And so, any buffer zone app, uh, st uh, students that are in buffer zones will get their assignment prior to that date mm -hmm. so that they have that same opportunity. And then it'll just be ongoing after that. Mm -hmm. We are, I'm sure the, what you're most interested in is how many do we have right now? Mm -hmm. And we have, it's, it's every day. I think we're up for probably around 370 students. We had 90 some in the buffer zones. Um, and we are, predicting that we'll have 543. And interestingly, we are 
almost identically on track as to where we were last year. Mm -hmm. So we shall see. Uh, that I newsletter went out this week, and there were a couple of important things in there. I, I, wanna, I don't usually do this, but I do want to emphasize. Uh, one is that the the uh, U.S. Census is going to be coming out in March. I mentioned this before, but also put some numbers to the impact that for every person, a state will get $2,400. So if you take that over 10 years, that's a sizable amount of money that you would not get otherwise. And it's, it's really important that people respond to that and as well as congressional seats. We've lost congressional seats in Massachusetts, but perhaps we would pick something up. I don't know if the numbers would warrant that this time, but it is, it is significant. And I think the thing that is, uh, some people are concerned about is confidentiality. The Bureau for the Census is required mm -hmm. by law to keep all the information confidential confidential within the U.S. government, too. So I, I just encourage people to do that. Then um, I also want to call out, uh, acknowledge our counselors and social workers. Last week was the school counseling um, week, and uh, I think that it's important to have this moment to acknowledge them because there's a lot of students that are able to be in school and be successful in school due to the support uh, that they receive from our counselors and social workers. So I want to thank them and acknowledge them. The um, other thing is that this year, and this will go out, um, last year we had a, uh, a speaker that was very well received uh, for, who had conversations, courageous conversations about um, cultural and racial issues. Um, Dr. Eliza Talanum, and she is going to be coming back again this spring. We have three sessions set up, March, April, and May, and that will be open to um, the, the target audience is all of our K through eight parents, but it's certainly open to the community as well. And we will, we will be publicizing that. The first one will be held at Thompson, the second at Dallin, and the third one at Gibbs. Um, let me see what else here. Well, I think what's on every teacher's and student's minds is that tomorrow's the last day before break. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it is, um, <coughs> happens to be Valentine's Day mm -hmm. also, so that's always an exciting day in schools. So um, I, it's an it's opportunity for these, this winter break to have students get healthy, teachers get healthy. Hopefully our teachers won't get sick, because, you know, which often happens when you start slowing down. But it is a chance to just air out these buildings and get everybody healthy for the, 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 the spring part of this year. So that concludes my report. Great. Any questions? All right. Thank you. Oh, can I say one more thing? Sure, of course. It's in the newsletter. The, I just want to call your attention to the <coughs> film. I almost forgot. The screening, screening of Intelligent Lives. Uh, this is going to take place in, in the high school. It is a, it is a film uh, about uh, students with disabilities mm -hmm. and how they, the, how they manage in their schooling and workforce lives and calling attention about what, what is intelligence. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to be a, a wonderful presentation. It is funded by the Arlington Education Foundation. Oh, it's, it, I think it's being supported by that, but it's also being supported by CPAC, right? So the high school special ed staff got a, a grant um, through the organizers of the film. Um, they were offering it, and so there'll be a panel discussion. Panel discussion with it. The, it's free, but do you have to get reserved tickets? We have an event, Eventbrite sign up. Eventbrite, yeah, okay. What day? That's it, thank you. What was that? What day? Oh, it's on Monday, oh. March 9th. I did have one question. Sure. Um, I, I was approached by someone about um, how notices went out about the kindergarten registration. It was just the usual way, right? Email, letter. I mean, how'd you? 
we mail out as many ways, get it out as many ways as possible. Okay. That's what I thought. Okay. Fine. It's still sort of a passive process yeah. because, you know, we don't know who's out there yeah, that I know. needs to register. Yeah. Um, I think principals have encouraged people that are in their schools to, if they know they have siblings. And what yeah. often happens is it's the parents who have children coming up mm -hmm. that wait to the summer to register. Yeah. It's an interesting phenomenon. It's the third kid syndrome. Like it's the know, third kid syndrome. We'll figure it out. <laughs> We're past that stage. <laughs> All right. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Their consent agenda. All items listed will be considered routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant. Warrant number 20150 dated 128-2020 in the amount of 128-068.17. <clears throat> approval of minutes from 19-2020 and 123-2020 and approval of the Arlington High School MASC Student Council Conference in Hyannis in March 2020. So moved. <clears throat> Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous? Mm -hmm. Policy, there's nothing to discuss. Subcommittee and liaison reports. Budget, Dr. Alice Nampi. So, um, budget met Monday morning, and we had a good discussion first about ski team, hearing from parents this time, and getting <laughs> some background on what their view of finances and the advantages of having a um, varsity team mm -hmm. were. Um, we've, I'm going to I'm reaching out to um, Mr. Bowler and um, Michael Mason to get some more information on what their assessment of the finances are for us to have some idea of numbers. Uh, the subcommittee also felt that we need to start discussing athletic fees and kind of the process by which we decide, we determine which teams are varsity mm -hmm that we accept for varsity um, and that we really should probably get this done by June. So, and we decided that it makes sense for budget to be working on this, although you, know, you could argue a little bit about policy, mm -hmm. but we're willing to do the work. So unless policy <laughs> wants to take it over. Mm -hmm. no. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, so we're gonna start working on how this should happen. Mm -hmm. um, but that also is dependent on the status of the school department's take on fees and adjusting them. Mm -hmm. And this has been something since we haven't had stability in the athletic directors. We, it's come up in mm -hmm. discussion, but it hasn't gone forward. Mm -hmm. So we had that. We also had a little bit of, we just saw the budget, mm -hmm. didn't have too many questions about it because we hadn't had a chance to peruse it yet. And uh, we'll be scheduling another meeting soon. Great, thank you. Uh, policies and procedures. Uh, no report except that uh, if you are a subscriber to the MASC list, uh, there's a little bit of a discussion about what happens when somebody sends an email to all seven members of the school committee, uh, which is an interesting question um, in that if we start responding individually with each other in the collection, it is a it is deliberative and a very definite <laughs> violation of open meeting law. So how do we handle that? We don't have a specific policy in that I think what we should do is codify the policy that in the event of, uh, of a, 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 an email addressed to all seven of us, that the chair will respond, will direct it as appropriate, and we'll include it in the correspondence with the notification back to the person who wrote it that because of the open meeting law uh, requirements, the other members of the committee cannot respond to the, to the bulk email. Something to that nature, but I think that that's something we need to talk about uh, and to place in our policy <laughs> for clarity. There was 
mm -hmm. don't, can't discuss the actual mm -hmm. policy, but go ahead. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to say we already have uh, a legal opinion because myself and a former member stepped into this mm -hmm. uh, issue and mm -hmm. uh, Liz gave us a uh, specific how to handle this. Mm -hmm. And it followed, I'm just sharing that mm -hmm. it's there already. Yeah. But we need to you put it in our policy manual well, and make she it addressed very that. Specific. So, yeah, whatever. Or, you know, maybe we. I, I think that is something. It's something we should look for because the question was: uh, Is this in your policy manual uh, specifically that was going around to other committees? And I don't want to go into any more right. depth. Think about it, so that you know we we can play with it in subcommittee. But I just wanted to uh, put that before us as something that we should at least think about. Uh, there was also a large set of policy revisions that they put out recently. Yeah, we're going to have to take a look at those too. Yeah. Okay. Great. They didn't seem very urgent, but. No, they're, they're pretty pro forma. Great. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, curriculum instruction, assessment, and accountability. Ms. Morgan. Um, I have reached out to Dr. Bodie and her team so that we can set a meeting when they're ready to um, look at the SOA as needed. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, community relations, Ms. Uh, we have a meeting on the 24th. Okay. Facilities, Mr. Hainer. Uh, met with the PTO of uh, Audison and uh, Gibbs. They were hoping for a lot more people, but we were in competition with the building rebuild. It was a good meeting and it turned out well. Thank you. Uh, My wife said you did a good job, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> All five of us. <laughs> And I heard the PA system is working again, so that's good. Oh. You, you fixed something. <laughs> uh, duct tape. Uh, uh, Arlington High School Building Committee we heard about. March 3rd is our next meeting. Okay. Tuesday, Calendar. March 3rd. Mm -hmm. Calendar committee? Uh, yeah, we met last week. Uh, we had a, a skeleton group of, um, from the committee, um, so we felt we couldn't make any decisions, but uh, we're continuing to look at possible new calendar looks, you know, so that we communicate mm -hmm. the information uh, better. Um, potentially adding policies around homework on uh, religious holidays that we don't have a day off on. And, um, and, and then just sort of the continued discussion, which I think is just gonna take much longer about uh, whether to reconsider um, uh, having school days on the religious holidays that we currently have off. And I just think that's a, a longer community discussion that's not going to be decided this year. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, skeletal committee, are you looking at Halloween? Are you looking, oh, at days off? <laughs> no. No, skeletal, oh, Halloween, yeah, 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 stop ball. Yeah, yeah. okay, no, no. <laughs> or maybe that's just for Salem. <laughs> Oh, uh, maybe time to adjourn. Election Modernization Course. Committee. Uh, yeah, we met, uh, let's see, last week, or no, the week before last, um, uh, just to talk about the warrant articles. Uh, there's going to be a warrant article on ranked choice voting, <coughs> a warrant article on um, changing how, um, how the vote happens for town meeting positions so that um, people with the most vote will get three-year positions, and if there's a one- or two-year, people with fewer votes would get the one- or two-year, sort of just sort of making mm -hmm. that make better sense. Um, and there was a third one that I've right now at this very moment can't remember. Okay. Where, right, where, to, where to vote? Uh, well, where we're gonna vote is definitely under the consideration. There's a, um, a survey that went out to the community and we're still getting back the results. So the thought is, oh, and the, the third one is, is to try to extend <gasps> the meeting, the extended the committee. committee. Because um, it, they just can't get the decisions made. So the survey that went out, until they get all those results, you really can't, re cause we have some prelim preliminary results about which precincts are problematic, but we need it, the whole thing to, to really evaluate it. Okay. Maybe shift things. Superintendent search process. Uh, the RFPs on the street will schedule a meeting uh, around the opening of the bids. Great. Yes. Uh, nothing. Hmm? Uh, liaison reports. Any liaison reports? Announcements? Any announcements? Future agenda items? No. All right. Executive session. To conduct strategy sessions in preparation of negotiation with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union or non-union personnel which held, which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect, um, uh, particularly the 
uh, the traffic supervisor's agreement, conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation, if, if which held in an open meeting may have a detriment effect, and executive session review of the executive session minutes from April 2018 through December 2018. Motion to enter executive session. So moved. <clears throat> Second. Second. Roll call. Mr. Hayner. Aye. Aye. Mr. Hayner. No. Yes. Alsus. Yes. yes. Schiffman. Yes. Morgan. Yes. Yes. <laughs> we won't be. We will not be coming back from executive session.